Good evening, everyone. Time for episode five of the Drums of Doom, part two of the Duarte Himstaff Saga, by me. Starting on page 52, we're into the chapter entitled The Secret Meeting. We'll take up where we left off. Okay. Amazing, Olak said, but I've got a feeling that this wouldn't be the best thing to wear around the pyramid. On the contrary, Draco chided, I think that the orcs would love you. Final preparations filled the rest of their evening. They outfitted their travel packs, checked their weapons, and prepared their clothing. Draco was familiar with the styles of Linnea's inhabitants, and he quickly adapted a wardrobe for them to fit in. They would appear as two young nobles, perhaps the sons of a baron, or princes too far down in the line of inheritance to become kings themselves. A full head of hair that covered his ears, and a puffy round noble's hat to hide them under, completed Draco's disguise. Our costume should pass the closest scrutiny, Draco said. Now let's go meet the escort party. They assembled in a carefully chosen meeting hall. It was a great, naturally formed cavern of some fifty feet in diameter and a ceiling half again as high. Only two passageways entered into it. One led to a honeycomb of tunnels directly beneath the pyramid fortress. The second led deep into the under-earth, where the resonant deep gnomes were currently mining the dark forced crystal. The same substance lined all the floors, walls, and ceiling of the cave, providing an eerie lime-green glow and, more importantly, shielding the cave from all forms of magical spying. Four ill-tempered giants and their abysmal hounds further guarded the chamber. It was therefore the perfect place for, for beginning a top-secret mission. These two men are your charges, Lieutenant de Gaulle, Derek said. They must reach their destination safely. We'll see to it, sir, he answered. I've assembled a crack team. Lieutenants de Gaulle and Tolina will provide the leadership necessary for your success. Every member of this team is an elite fighter and an expert in their chosen fields. They complete the full range of skills necessary for a campaign, for a campaign force of Drakkar Noir. All that I need to know, Draco said, is that they graduated from the academy. That's proof enough. They all achieved the highest marks, much like you. <clears throat> we need not engage every threat, Olak said, as long as we can pass them safely and without detection. Don't worry, Lieutenant de Gaulle. We've been in enough fights to know when it's necessary and when it's not. You're all valiant. Derek said. The dangers are unknown because of the terrain, but if we're lucky, you will reach the surface without incident. Ready yourselves, Lieutenant de Gaulle said. After inspection, we're moving out. I'll activate the mirror from here, and when you're gone, it will be as if you've never been. I have entrusted Lieutenant de Gaulle with his own mirror for the return trip. Utilize the portal setting for this room if you must abort the mission. Prepare yourselves. For it is for a free Dragonia that you do battle. Like in any group of specially trained warriors, there came a widespread hoo-yeah from deep within. Olak mingled with the soldiers, informally inspecting each of them in turn. Stopping briefly to speak with them, he soon had a fair understanding of their qualities. I see that you pack a Linrudian spear, Olak said to Sergeant Goldsmith, an unusual weapon in these times. Her hair glistened like her name, an unusual but not unheard of color among the dark Elfar. Her eyes were dark like her complexion, her face was lean and capable like her physique. I joined up during the Minion War, sir. I never liked the idea of closing in on a caretaker. I have never seen one. Are they as horrible as they say? It usually took four of us to bring one down, she said. They look like squid but stand eight feet tall. They are the most terrifying beings that I have ever seen. They cost us many lives in that war. I hope that I never meet one. You'll know a minion if you see one. They walk upright, upon two thick tentacles. Most have eight arms over ten feet long, covered in suction cups and grasping claws, but some have more. They can fight with all of them and with their poisonous beak.
Their eyes are black and shiny like wet glass, but their minds are their deadliest weapon. They can control untrained minds. Humans are their favorite food. In ancient times they enslaved thousands. The sentients are descendants of their human slaves who learned enough of their master's ways to escape. Your weapon is noble, thought by my master to be the king of weapons. Most people seem to assume that the spear is best used by the clumsy or poorly trained. On the contrary, Olak said thoughtfully, my master could use a Linrudian spear with such skill that he could re remove each of an expert swordsman's hands in an instant. Only an ignorant fighter would have such reservations. I'll try not to disappoint you, sir. Nor I you, Sergeant. Squad, Lieutenant Dugal ordered, assemble for inspection. Moments later, the group stood in formation, including Olak and Draco. Despite their superior rank, this was not their squad, and they deferred their position to Lieutenants de Gaulle and to Lena, de Gaulle's second in command. Are there any last-minute questions or ideas before last inspection? We may need another mountaineering kit to cover the lieutenants, sir, Sergeant Newmason said. We can probably handle them with our kits, but one more wouldn't hurt. Good point, Sergeant as long as they can handle the extra weight. No problem there, Draco said. Olek and I can split the equipment, and we should still be okay. Anything else, New Mason? Nothing, sir. Anybody? No. Well then, let's empty those packs for inspection. In moments, each professional soldier had his gear emptied and separated. Shout out if your pack is lacking. This is crunch time. Four canteens full. One week's iron rations dry. Four pair of knit socks, preferably clean. Two sets undergarments, one pair of pants. One tunic, rations kit, spork and knife, tinder and flint, rope and grapple. Mountaineer's kit complete with boot spikes, crampons, pitons and harness. Herbalist med kit with bandages, waterproof cloak and field toilet kit. Is everyone's kit complete? Yes, sir. Anyone who's been in the military will be familiar with this sort of uh, inspection. In the Rangers, it was a uh, commonplace. This is my fantasy version of that. Okay. Repack. Refilling, cinching tight, and tying down their packs with practice speed required only a bit more time than emptying them. Stand two for weapons inspection. One by one, the squad leaders examined each soldier's weapons of war with a sword or rapier, dagger or dart, and each professional's weapons were, of course, in perfect care and condition. Pack and sheath weapons. Does any soldier here have any second thoughts about this mission? No, sir. And does any soldier here have any misgivings whatsoever about laying their life down for their comrades and country, if such a need be? No, sir. Does any soldier here have personal obligations or ties to family? which are too great to fully commit themselves in their minds to this mission. No, sir. Excellent. Then here is the mission brief. Our job is to get the lieutenants safely to the surface and on their way to Linnea. If possible, we will do so with silence and stealth, to such a degree that no man nor beast should realize that we've passed or even breathed the air of their surroundings. If we should have to fight our way through, then every blow should count, every sentry silenced, and every beast vanquished without mercy or regret. We will move swiftly yet cautiously, without stopping, save for an encounter or to take head counts. We make no camp until the lieutenants are safe and we have returned here. Understood? Yes, sir. The new mason's on point. Goldsmith and Carnage are the spearhead. Talina and I will take the third spot in front of the lieutenants. <clears throat> and Braidwick and McCune will take the rear by 20 paces. Their job is to keep any following enemies off us and to provide backup as needed. We will stop every half of a league for a head count. The pace will be moderate but unhurried. The standard 45 minute leagues should suffice. Stay sharp and keep an eye on your buddies above all else. We leave no comrades behind unless there is nothing left of them to return home. Squad, attention! Let's move out into the maw of Derek's purple worm. Hoo yeah! De Gaulle's team was through the portal in seconds. 
their passing causing instantaneous transportation through necromantic folding. They emerged in stride, as if their first steps began in one location and landed in another countless, indeed possibly limitless, miles away. Behind them, Derek was quick to close the portal on his side and erase any signs that the mission had ever gathered there. There was no need to contact Vlad. He already knew that the pieces were in motion. The game had just begun. Their pawns advanced. <clears throat> they emerged deep within the bowels of King Rodman's mine, in a small cave chisel chiseled out by the gnarled hands of the hill dwarves. Their surroundings were deathly silent. Pausing for several moments, their eyes adjusted to their lightless world. All of them had pigmented eyes, the result of a childhood exposed to the sun, but they were dark alfar, and they could still see in the absolute darkness of under-earth, because their eyes were sensitive to the other en energies that existed there. In fact, few other beings on Tempest could see as well in the dark, and none could see any better. This was a large contributor to their deadliness, and the reason that many of the other inhabitants of Under-Earth feared them. Caution was still in order, however, for their powers below were not absolute. Others, such as the Minions, Darg, some dragons, and other more ancient powers that lived deeper still, vied with them for supremacy of the dark. The vulnerability of mortality tempered their elfin longevity, and when wounded, their blood flowed as others did. <clears throat> Diligent training and a desire to attain perfection in themselves and their profession contributed to their martial prowess. These qualities were not true of every dark elf, but they were true of every member of the Drakkar Noir, and it was therefore true of Lieutenant de Gaulle's team. They moved silently and as one, every hand and arm signal relayed and understood. They accomplished soundlessness through skill and the use of enchanted equipment. Their very boots and cloaks were especially magical, the standard for adventuring parties of Dark Elfar. Their material was supple, strong and fire-resistant. In darkness, it concealed their body heat, camouflaging them from subterranean eyes and the heat-sensing organs of many monstrous denizens. Furthermore, it was a quiet and actually sound-deadening material, a secret combination of materials and magical incantations known only to a few families of Dark Elfar allowed them to accomplish the engineering marvel. They were the perfect outer garments for a group dependent upon stealth for survival. Enchanted gear aside, their training was such that they were capable of nearly silent movement, even without such magical accoutrements. But with them, they were almost quieter than silence itself. Their eyes adjusted. They moved out with the signal from Lieutenant de Gaulle, New Mason leading, with Goldsmith and Carnage close behind them. King Rodham's Mine The hill dwarves were miners of the most excellent sort. Carefully engineered, their passageways were well-hewn and stoutly shorn. They cautiously worked hazardous substrates, avoided or circum circumvented them. They built strong bridges over natural obstacles, such as underground rivers or chasms. Working every vein of ore to its fullest, their knowledge of stone and minerals left few precious materials unearthed. These and many other such qualities made their work as safe as such endeavors could be, and the results of their tunneling very lasting. Abandoned mines also created new inhabitants for other creatures, new habitats for other creatures to live in. Such simple facts did not escape Lieutenant de Gaulle. Derek's portal had placed them somewhere within the lowest level of the mine. Their depth below the surface was unknown, but New Mason estimated it to be at least two miles. Depending on how far away the dwarf's elevator shaft was, the journey could take hours or even days to complete. There were signs to help them on their way. The tracks of mining carts were cut more deeply into the stone in certain hallways, and once they reached the main tunnels, there should be a track. Closing his raised fist, Lieutenant de Gaulle called a halt. Quietly, he tried to use a direction spell. It quickly became clear that such magic was useless here. Dark Boss Crystal lined the walls, a powerful source of energy but a complete inhibitor to divination spells. 
They would have to find their way by using conventional methods. Move out, he signaled, and New Mason led them forward. Stealthily, she considered the next bend in the tunnel, or the correct passage to take in an intersection. In time, her intuition proved itself, and they came upon a great wide tunnel, three rows of iron tracks passing through it. Several carts stood empty and ready for filling upon them. Covered by decades of dust, they stood rusted and abandoned. It was clear that the dwarves, at least, no longer ventured here. The carts were all oriented in the same direction. It was the final clue that they needed to bring them to the elevator shaft and from there to the surface. The tunnel was immense, over thirty feet in height and width, and side passageways created many dangerous areas for them to cross. Cunning enemies could easily plan an ambush from such positions, and Lieutenant de Gaulle had to take all these factors into consideration. Pointing quickly, he split the team. Talina would lead the left flank, and he would lead the right, behind New Mason. In seconds, the team had assumed their new roles, and they began advancing. New Mason froze, her sign language indicating at least twelve individuals hidden in the tunnel ahead. Eight more enemies waited hidden against the walls down two east and west passages, clearly an, am an ambush. There was no audible sound, but was it intended for them? De Gaulle thought that surely it must be. A foreign voice within the darkness soon answered his question. Your team is surrounded, De Gaulle, the stranger said. Lower your weapons to the floor. New Mason's hand signals told him that there was no way for the enemies to see them or accurately affect them with weapons. Who so boldly addresses me? That is of no concern to anyone among you who wish to live. My army is close behind, de Gaulle said. It would be wise for you to surrender. <laughs> we know that you are alone. Either way, it's a gamble. But you should know well that we surrender to no one. The longer that he talked, the more time his team had to study the terrain and prepare the defense. Tolina had already cast several protective spells, and he could feel their influence upon his body and mind. If you refuse surrender, then you will all surely die. <clears throat> an honorable opponent would identify himself and his reasons. You possess an object that was stolen from us. Quickly, he considered all his possessions. Perhaps he meant something that one of his team carried. What object? Surely you are mistaken. I am Vremic, son of Ilion, and you carry the sword of my father, who was stolen from the battlefield by your father, Durin de Gaulle. Then you speak of the bridge over Calzakin, and the battle that ended the Sentian Wars. That battle proved the superiority of my race. Your race left the field on litters or not at all. My father won this sword in mortal combat against General Ilian Sai. It is a spoil of war. He looked to Draco and Olag for their support or disagreement, but he received only thumbs-up signals of approval. Draco clearly intended to fight, but the security of the mission was at stake. Maybe there was another way. Perhaps there is another way, son of Ilian. I will listen only for a short while longer. In order to spare our teams, I suggest a duel. You and I in single combat. The winner takes the sword. The loser abandons their claim to it as a point of honor. There was a chuckle and then an arrogant laugh. We will combat without magic. Plain sword against sword without armor. Ilian's blade on a flat stone between us. Our companies hold their positions until the end. These are my terms. I accept. Draco's vigorous signaling told him that he was acting foolishly. He clearly wanted an all-out fight. Don't worry, his hands told Draco. The mission is too important. You just might get your wish anyway. Keep an eye on these bastards. They only possess honor among themselves. Stepping out into the open, he cautiously began removing his cloak and armor. He was somewhat relieved to see the form of his opponent doing the same. Vremic was tall and broad-shouldered. His skin was pale, his features gaunt and hairless, without so much as an eyebrow. His smile was wide, bloodless and thin, infinitely confident and full of contempt. His eyes were large, dark and piercing. He provided the weapons, two plain straight longswords, 
tossing one onto the ground between them. By the light of the sword, then, de Gaulle said, kneeling by the flat rock, he carefully laid Ilion's sword upon the stone, its unsheathed blade, bathing the cave in golden light. Without taking his eyes off his opponent, he retrieved the weapon provided for the duel. By the light of the sword, Black Elf. Lieutenant Tolina heard well the discourse between Vermic and Jason, and she knew that the sentient's leader did not intend to honor his own words. In fact, he had lied through his teeth. She could tell by the tone of his voice and the tremor in his words, and she relayed this simple fact to Olak behind her in the secret sign language of the Dark Elfar. He lies, she told him. He will betray Jason at the most opportune moment. I thought as much, Olak replied. Don't worry. We're all ready to fight. One more thing, Talina said. There are at least eight more of them cloaked by invisibility spells. We must beware their mind powers, Olak said. They're in for a big surprise, then, for the Dark Horse Crystal should, observe most of that, should absorb most of their powers. I'll relay the word, Olak said. Keep an eye on Lieutenant de Gaulle. Behind him, Braidwick, Braidwick read Olak's signal and relayed it to New Mason on the right flank, and on down that line to McCune in the rear. They were little needed words, for they all knew the chaotic ways of their enemy. The sentient's treachery toward all other races was legendary, and many among them had already encountered their war parties in the past. The team's weapons had long since been in hand, bowstrings were loaded and crossbows knocked. Lieutenant de Gaulle and Vermic paced around the circle of their makeshift ring. The sword is mine, Vermic said. I'll grant you one last chance to surrender. <clears throat> My father never wanted the sword. He only acted he acted only in defense of his homeland when your people invaded. It was a fair and mortal combat. The sword itself recognizes me as the rightful successor. Your necromancy must have perverted its thoughts. When you are dead, it will once again return to my family, from whence it came. The sword is a symbol of Dragonia's victory, Vermic. I will never dishonor the sacrifice of my people, Ungard. Vermic was the pinnacle of what his race could achieve. Physically strong and gifted with special mental abilities, he could wield the blade, cast magical spells, and shatter stone with but a, th but a thought. The sentients were once human, but if that were true in some far distant past, then it no longer was. Centuries of minion enslavement had changed them forever. The ruthless minions tortured them with their sinister and alien mental powers, and as time passed, the sentients gained these same capabilities for themselves. They could read minds, heat, bend, and move materials with but a thought, or crush through their opponents' mental barriers, only to leave them raving lunatics or mere vegetables. De Gaulle's team now faced these enemies, the mighty sentients, the descendants of minion slaves that had left, dark elven, left the dark elven nation of Dragonia ravaged, and the sentients themselves beaten and exiled to the astral plane, which they now called home. The first clash of swords was titanic, the result of each individual's disgust of the other. It was a test of strength of wills, blade against blade, eye to eye, and breath against breath, with little thought of technique. You will die here, son of de Gaulle. Jason was no fool. He would never waste his breath on speech during battle. He stared back defiantly. Such a look might have proved fatal to any man of lesser conviction, for Vermic's powers were such that he could bore into the psyche of any average opponent and cripple him. Insane images might take the poor soul to some remote place within themselves, never to return or assault his nerves with pain unending. Vermic did not intend to engage Jason fairly. He wanted the sword no matter what the cost. Indeed, his failure to acquire it would mean the certain death of himself and his company at the hands of their leader, a disembodied brain so powerful that it no longer needed a body to house itself. The sentients referred to it only as the Great Mind. If subterfuge was necessary to ensure his success on this field, then so much the better. It was then that he brought all his mental might down upon Jason, 
for one psychologically crushing duel. Electromagnetic waves surged through the neural network of his brain, launching themselves into the mind of his enemy. Seconds passed, and yet the son of de Gaulle was unassailed. Did he possess some unseen magic device that protected him? Surprised, Jason asked. I am yet unscathed. But how, Vermick said, befuddled. You chose the wrong field for psychic war. Now we'll have to finish it my way, if you insist. His assault was savage, yet professional, each blow of his sword well practiced and expertly guided. Parrying, countering, Jason studied Vermick. He was larger and heavier than he was, but no stronger. Of this he was certain. Vermick was, however, clearly a more experienced swordsman than he was, almost certainly a survival of many more combats, but maybe he could somehow use that knowledge to his own advantage. Hiding his true ability, he fought back only well enough to defend himself. Waiting for some moment of weakness, he hoped that somehow one would, prevent it, would present itself. Vremek was merciless, hoping to end the challenge soon. The son of de Gaulle was offering him only a dismal resistance. If this was the best that he could do, then the son of de Gaulle was certainly a lesser man than his father was. Surrender now, while you still live. Never. Then die like a miserable black elven dog. Jason had been insulted in his life, but never in so vulgar of a way, and such bold lip service made him consider doing something foolish. He did not, of course, but he did consider it. Instead, he opted for compromise. <clears throat> Vremig was focusing his attacks with the sword only, if he possessed other fighting tools, then he had not thought of using them yet. Jason wasted no time. When Vremek next swung at him from a high, unguarded position, he went low, driving his fist into Vremek's groin. Air exploded from his lungs, and his sword flew from his hands. Jason grasped him, grasped him, left hand upon Vremek's right wrist, his right clutching Vremek's groin. In one sudden, Herculean effort, he lifted Vremek above his head and hurled him down. It looked like the Vremek was beaten. His fellows rose to attack. Vremek laughed from the ground. Now you will all die. The sword is mine. He had landed close to the golden sword, a mistake on Jason's part, and Vremek now reached out to take it up. Suddenly it leaped away from him and into the hands of his nemesis. It seems that you've forgotten the character of your own father's sword. Unfailingly will it return to its rightful living wielder's hand. The blade, at least, has honor. It will return to me soon, then, Vremek rasped, for we outnumber you two to one. It was then that he sing signaled his knights to attack. Speaking mentally to his fellows, he raged, Destroy them with all of your mental might. And that's where we'll end episode five, here in the middle of page 64. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it. The reason I don't go beyond 30 minutes is because it takes a long time to upload to YouTube. And anyway, we'll take up with the battle between Jason de Gaulle and the Sentians next time. And remember, as always, read the Drums of Doom, Part 2 of the Dwardine Staff Saga, by me, in all the following volumes. Thank you and have a good night.